Hi, everyone. Hello and welcome. Um, please, if you can, go ahead and type your name and where you're joining us from into the chat today. I'm going to be presenting, so I'm just getting my screen up here. Okay, so let's get you into the Sprite slideshow. All right, so what we're doing today is career exploration through informational interviewing. And what informational interviewing is, it's the chance that you get to speak to someone who's in the field that you're interested in, but you don't have to worry about making your impression so much as you're trying to find out, does this field really match me? So it's really a good chance to ask questions of someone. For folks that would like to utilize closed captioning that we have available, please just click on the link in the chat. So I'm Molly McFawn. I'm the 4-H educator for Orange and Washington counties. We also have from UVM, we have Kimberly Griffin here with us today and she's the educator for Bennington and Rutland counties. So now that we're all here, I'd like to have us all take a moment, if you'd like, to make sure that your names are updated with the name that you'd like to be called today. And if you feel comfortable, please share the pronouns that you'd like us to use today. This is not a requirement, but if you'd like, you can go to your picture, you hover over it, and there's a three dot menu there. There you can click on how it is that you change your name. So you go to your picture in, the, um, in participants to get that done. Now, while we're together here, in this space, we do have a social code that I'd like to go over. And that social code is posted here and I'm gonna read it out as well. So guests will be muted unless they're talking. We want you to share thoughts and questions via chat if you'd like. You also can share those questions with us by raising your hand if you'd like to speak. Please be courteous and respectful and try to make sure that you don't have any distractions. So no making faces, try to make sure nothing's majorly happening in your background. And when possible, keep your video on. This is great practice because usually you do this sort of, um, of an interview in person or over Zoom with both of your faces showing. So if that's possible, that would be great. And also stay engaged and participate fully. So please do ask the questions that you have come up with, or if you can't think of any, you can use the list of 20 questions that we sent out as well. So now, today's guest is Rachel Selig. She's a staff attorney for Vermont Legal Aid, and I'd like to give her a chance to introduce herself. Thanks, Molly. As Molly said, my name is Rachel, and I have been working at Vermont Legal Aid as a staff attorney for just over eight years now. Um, currently, I work in our disability law project, and that means that my job is to be a lawyer for people who have disabilities and have legal issues that are related to those disabilities. So this might mean that I'm representing someone because they have been discriminated against either at work or at school or in a public place, or it mean, might mean that they are in need of certain health services that they're not getting um, and they need some help to navigate the process or, or appeal a decision in order to get those, those health services. I also do a lot of work to help kids who have disabilities make sure they get the services that they need in school uh, through special education laws. Uh, and I work to protect the rights of people with disabilities to maintain their ability to make their own decisions in their lives in cases about whether they should have a guardian or not. So those are some of the major things that I do in my work at Legal Aid. But Legal Aid is actually bigger than just the Disability Law Project. We are a nonprofit law firm, so we don't charge our clients any money for the services that they receive from us. We're instead, we're funded by a lot of different grants that the state or the federal government or private organizations provide and that we apply for. And we have offices across the state in Burlington, in Montpelier, in Springfield, Rutland, and St. Johnsbury. Also, currently, we're all still working from our own homes. Uh, and we have a lot of different projects that help people with everything from the things I talked about to evictions from rental housing 
uh, to uh, domestic violence for people who need protection orders because of domestic violence in the home. We have a whole project that helps people with health care issues and making sure they have access to health care and health insurance. Uh, we have a project that helps people who are victims of crime get the protection and the, and the rights they have as victims of crime. So we do a whole bunch of different things as lawyers and paralegals and lay advocates at Legal Aid. Now, one thing I just want to remind folks about, this is a safe space where we can ask questions, any questions that you'd like, and it really is a great opportunity to ask those questions in practice. Um, I don't mind leading off. So you can sort of get a feel for it, but I'd love it if you guys would be able to ask questions as well if you, if you feel comfortable, okay? So because I'm a 4-H educator, I always would love to know, do you have, uh, Rachel, a specific anecdote, uh, anecdote about 4-H that stayed with you because of the impact that it had on you and that remembering you still have an impact from that 4-H experience? That's a really good question. You know, I have so many positive experiences from my time in 4-H that it's kind of hard to pick out one thing. One of my favorite, some of my favorite memories are from the 4-H horse state show because that was, I was in the 4-H uh, uh, horse project for most of my time. Uh, there was one year I remember going, it was a year that our coaches, our, our 4-H leaders couldn't go with us, and so we were all there kind of on our own, which was different for our club anyway. Um, and for some reason that year, they, whoever had designed the jump courses decided that they were going to design them about three inches too high for every class. And so they were higher than I had ever competed, and I decided I was going to go for it anyway. And my poor horse, <laughs> he really was like not prepared for that. And so I kind of treated it like a training, right? Like that it was, I was not gonna, there's no way I was gonna win this class. That wasn't what it was about. Um, and he came over to me afterwards and he kind of was like, you shouldn't have done that. And I was like, whoa, that's so strange. But what I really remember is that the people that were in the class with me came over afterwards and they were like, you did a great job and, you know, like we all were in this weird situation and, you know, just, I just remember that kind of feeling of, yes, we were competitors and it was a competitive situation, but we were also there to kind of support each other and get through this kind of weird moment together. And so I feel like there are so many of those through my time in 4-H, but that's kind of, of, of one where it was, just kind of, you know, persevering and deciding what I wanted to get out of the experience. And that's something that I try and think about kind of wherever I am. Excellent, that's a great example. So I'd love to open up the floor. If folks wanna try asking questions of Rachel, like I said, you've got ones that we sent out or any sort of question that you have. All right, I'm gonna start out one here. Um, Rachel, can you tell us a little bit about your career path and what led you to the role that you're in today? Sure, um, I, so like I said, I've been at Legal Aid for about eight years. And before that, I spent three years in law school because that's how long law school takes. Um, but I did have a little bit of a career be between college and law school. Uh, the first thing I did was I, I served in AmeriCorps I moved across the country for a year and lived just outside of Seattle. And I worked in a public school system with kids grades K through eight, um, both in school and after school. Um, and then I came home and I did a bunch of political work. I worked on a political campaign. Um, and then I spent about two and a half years working for Congressman Welch, who's actually still our congressman doing kind of constituent service work is what we call it. You know, when Vermonters were in need of help from uh, the federal government and they weren't getting it, they would call us and, and try and get some help. So I did that for about two and a half years. So I kind of got here by a combination of political work and public service and that time in AmeriCorps. And, you know, all of those experiences, I think, led me to a place of I wanted to be able to be more of an advocate for people um, and, and really be able to help people enforce their rights and uh, protect themselves against um, unfair and unjust 
actions. And so that's really kind of what led me to the law and to legal aid in particular. Great, thank you. We've got a question in the chat here from Caitlin. What's the hardest part of your job? That's a really good question. I think probably the hardest part of my job is that there are things that happen to people that are really unfair and that are wrong and that people shouldn't have to go through, but that are also legal and are allowed to happen. And so when I have to tell someone, you know, I agree this was wrong, this shouldn't have happened, but there's not actually anything that you can do about it, that is that always makes me feel terrible. I always feel horrible about not being able to give one, give someone help. Um, and so that's probably my least favorite part of the work that I have to do. Okay. Well, to follow up on that, what do you enjoy most about the work that you do? Uh, there are so many things I enjoy about the work that I do. Um, one thing I like is that there's a variation in the work I do. So some of the work I do is really for individual people, right? Like somebody has a specific problem. And so my job is to take that case to court and represent them uh, and solve that specific problem. Uh, and I like getting to know the people I get like, like getting to know their families. Um, I'm also kind of a nerd, and so spending time doing research, legal research and legal writing is something I really enjoy. But I also get to work on what we can call more of systems issues, right? Thinking about the policies and the laws at the state level or the federal level that impact our clients and advocating for things to change to make it better for our clients, not for just one person, but for everybody who has a has a disability or has a family member with a disability. Uh, so I really like that about my work, you know, getting to do that kind of bigger picture work and getting to have that mix between individual work and systems work. Okay, we've got another question in the chat here. This is from Cordelia. What do you hope to do in the future with your career? That's a good question. Thank you for asking that, Cordelia. You know, I, one of the things that's hard for me about that is I finished law school eight years ago and then I got my dream job, right? Like the job that I wanted was to come work at legal aid and be a legal aid lawyer. And so it's often really hard for me to think about like what other job would I ever possibly want, right? Um, but one of the things I like about legal aid is that we have lots of different projects. And so I could see myself in the future working for one of those other projects, um, or maybe even in the future working kind of on the other side of things, working for the state, working kind of from the inside of some of our systems to try and make them better. Uh, I could also see myself not being a lawyer forever, right? One of the things about getting a law degree is, yeah, you can be a lawyer, but you can also do lots of other things. It's a really good place to kind of learn how to think in a specific way that's helpful if you're interested in anything political, but also if you're interested in kind of government generally or um, just how systems work. And so that's not necessarily something where you have to be acting as a lawyer, you know, working for a, a, a business or a nonprofit uh, in some other way is definitely kind of a place that you can go. Um, when you have a law degree. You don't have to have a law degree to do those things, but it certainly can be helpful. Um, I'll ask one. Um, Rachel, what skills do you think are the most important for someone interested in a job like yours? There are so many skills that I think are important in my job, but I think are important in so many jobs that people are interested in. Um, for my job in particular, I think 
it's really important to have empathy and patience for the people that I'm working with. One of the things that we often say is no one is calling legal aid because they're having a good day, right? Like if you need a lawyer, something has probably gone wrong. And so being able to be empathetic to that and, and kind of put yourself in the shoes of the person who's calling and looking for your help is really important. Having compassion for people, I think, is really important. You know, one of the things about being a lawyer is that you really oftentimes need to have a real close attention to detail, right? There have been cases in courts that have been won or lost based on where a comma was placed in a sentence. Right? So if you think about that, you, you know, you have to be really a good editor and a good writer and a good thinker in order to really represent people to the best of your ability. So that, I think, is really important. And I think another thing for the kind of lawyer that I am where I go to court and represent people is you have to at least tolerate, if not like, public speaking. Um, there's not usually a big crowd in a courtroom, but when you're in court as a lawyer, you go in and there's a table where you sit, but anytime you want to talk, anytime you want to ask a, a witness a question or say something to the judge, you stand up and you speak. Um, and so I often think when I go into a courtroom, I'm often back a little bit in my head in thinking about like public speaking competitions in 4-H or public presentation competitions in 4-H or giving oral reasons at a judging competition, right? Like all of those things were really good practice for being able to walk up to someone I don't know and explain what it is I want and why I want it. Um, and so I think those are probably some of the things. And those are things that are helpful in a lot of different careers. I wouldn't say those are just important in terms of being a lawyer. Excellent. You've got another question in the chat. Caitlin would like to know, what's the most common type of case that you get? Um, there are probably two different kinds of cases that I, I get in my role the most. And one kind are special education cases, where there's usually it's a, a parent rather than a student, although sometimes the student calls us directly, where the student has a disability and they need special services from their school and they're not getting the services or not they're not getting all of the services or either getting the services but they're not the right services and so they're getting in trouble at school those kinds of things those come up a lot uh, and then the other kind of case that I get a lot of are cases about what's called guardianship and guardianship is a, a court process where the court decides someone is not able to make their own decisions about things like where they live or the, where they work or what medical care they get or who their doctor is. And so they're, they assign someone else to be their guardian and to make those decisions for them. And if you think about those things, those are probably things that you want to be able to make your own decisions about yourself once you're an adult. And that's usually true of people with disabilities too. And so a lot of times in those cases, what we're doing, what I'm doing is trying to help people protect their right to still make those decisions for themselves if they can. Uh, so those are probably the two kinds of cases I do the most of. Thanks for that question, Caitlin. I'll ask one. Okay. Um, what do you wish that you'd known when you were starting out in this career? Was there anything that you wish you knew about in advance, sort of like what we're doing here? What would be something that would be helpful for someone trying to go into this kind of a career? Well, one thing I wish I had known, and it's possible I knew it and forgot it at the time, is that you actually don't have to go to law school to be a lawyer in Vermont. There is something called reading for the bar. So if you've gone to college, you do have to have gone to college, but if you've gone to college and you've graduated from college, you can actually apprentice basically with a lawyer and study the law for four years 
and then take the bar exam. And if you pass, you get to be a lawyer in Vermont without having gone to law school, without having taken out lots of student loans for law school. And I have several colleagues who are either in the process of doing that or that's how they became lawyers at legal aid. Like they started out as a paralegal or a lay advocate or even a support staff person, someone who answered our phones. And they did that. They, they asked one of the lawyers in our office if they could be their, their mentor and teach and let them do that. And they studied for four years and now they are lawyers or they're on their way to being lawyers. And I think that's just so cool. And I, you know, I really wish I had better understood that that was an option in Vermont as a way to become a lawyer. Uh, and I think we have a lot of those kinds of careers in Vermont where you can study something with a professional um, as a way of learning how to do something. And I think that's a really cool thing about our state. Absolutely. Well, what are uh, some big projects? Have you worked on any project recently that you finished up in the last few months that you'd like to tell us about? Yeah. Some of it you might not be able to, but one some of it some of it's a little hard to talk about because I do have to protect the confidentiality of my individual clients. But one thing that I've been working on uh, earlier this year, and this isn't something I've finished up so much as just a big project that's always on my mind. Earlier this year, I became the chair of the Special Education Advisory Panel for the state of Vermont. And that is a big project because right now, the rules about special education are open. And so people across the state can be commenting on them. And our group, the Special Education Advisory Panel, is working on what we think the rules should be for special education in schools. So that's definitely a big project that I've been, been working on and finishing up. Um, you know, I think another big project that we've had going on for a while has been about something that's called supported decision making, uh, where, uh, and this is kind of connected to what I was talking about in terms of guardianship. Uh, so it's the idea of people with disabilities should have the right to make their decisions too, uh, and what are the ways that we can support them in making those decisions, and who are the people in their lives who can support them. In making those decisions. And so kind of teaching people about that has been a good amount of my job, um, professionals and people with disabilities. And so I've done a fair number of trainings and kind of community education about that. That's another big project. Uh, I wish I could talk about some of my case projects, but I really I probably can't get into those, unfortunately. Fair enough. We understand that. Yeah. Are there anybody else have some questions out there? Oh, it looks like Cordelia said she had to go. She thanks you very much for your time. It was nice to meet you, Cordelia. Well, I have a question. Okay. Um, can you think of, are there any questions that we should be asking that we're not asking? Can you think of anything that might be a help to someone interested in becoming an attorney or considering that career? I think one of the questions that I get asked about that a lot is, what should I study in college if I want to be a lawyer? Um, and I know that that college decision can be a really big thing for a lot of people. Uh, and if I were to answer my own question, I would say you can study anything in college and still become a lawyer. And I think that's something that's different than like wanting to become a doctor or a veterinarian where you really have to study the sciences in order to then go on to medical school or vet school. I had classmates in law school who had studied science, who had studied philosophy, who had studied English, which is what I studied in college, who had studied um, political science, who'd studied religion, who, you know, all sorts of different things. Um, because you don't have to go in with the same kind of knowledge base to go to law school that you might need to go to medical school. And that means that you can come in with kind of almost any kind of experience. And then when you're in law school, you'll learn what you need to learn 
in law school. And honestly, after law school, you'll learn what you need to learn when you're practicing as a lawyer. Um, because law school helps you a lot with passing the bar exam, which is something you have to do in order to be a lawyer. But practicing law is a thing that I think is really important in terms of learning how to be a lawyer is just getting in there and doing it. So, learning by doing, right? <laughs> Mm hmm that's right. Oh, Caitlin's got a question for us. Okay. The longest time that you've had to work on a particular case? I had a case that I argued in front of the Vermont Supreme Court a couple of years ago now. And actually a couple of years ago? Yeah, I think it was, I can't remember if it was last fall or the fall, I think it was last fall. Maybe it was the fall before. No, I think it was the fall of 2018. Um, and that case had actually started with one of my colleagues in 2015. So that case had gone on for three years. Um, we had another case that we had in federal court um, that started before I even started working at Legal Aid. I think it was filed in 2010. And it finished up about a year ago. So that case went on for nine years and I was involved with it for about three and a half of those years. So some of our cases go on for a really long time. Other cases are done in a week, right? If somebody is experiencing violence in their home and they need an order of protection against the person who's being violent, those cases are, are supposed to be done in two weeks. Um, that's something that should happen really quickly in court. Um, and so with those kinds of cases, you kind of drop all your other work and you dive into them and you help that person get what they need to be safe as fast as possible. Um, and then some of our cases that are big or complicated or have to go to multiple different judges, they take a really long time. All right, so I've got, if anybody else has a final question, this is the time to do it. I've got one that I'm interested in. Oh, here we go. Oh. Adding to what's the shortest case you've seen. Um, the shortest case I've seen is probably like a, a case that was re resolved in a couple of hours um, where somebody had a big, huge problem but we were able to make like two or three phone calls and get things solved before the end of the workday. And so that's always, that is always really gratifying where we can help someone fix a problem really fast. Oh, I bet. How did uh, COVID affect the way that you work and the way that the, the legal system is running? How is the uh, that we have, how has that changed it? And what do you think about it? It has changed so many things. So first of all, um, even though kids have gone back to school, we have not gone back to our offices. So usually I work in an office with 20 other people, more than 20 other people, and we're in and out of each other's offices and kind of talking to each other about, you know, how we should approach our cases and that sort of thing. And now we're all in our own homes. And so that has definitely changed things a lot. Um, but the courts have changed too. So most of the courts are now not doing in-person hearings unless they absolutely have to. And part of that is most of our courtrooms are actually pretty small in the state of Vermont. And so they're not big enough to have all the people in them that need to be in them for a court case to happen. Um, keeping people six feet apart, you know, all that sort of thing. And so I've had a lot of cases where I've just been on the phone with the judge and my client um, and the other side. And that can be really hard, especially for some of my clients with disabilities, where communication is maybe not their strongest asset. Um, and, you know, help, helping them know when to speak and when to not speak and um, making sure they understand what's going on. That can be really hard without the visual cues of a courtroom. Uh, so that's been hard. And, you know, our office usually is open to the public. People can walk in and say, hey, I need help. And we'll, you know, find someone who, who can do an intake with them. 
And right now our offices are not open to the public. And so the only ways to reach us are by phone or by using our online intake form on our website. Um, and at first we were worried that was gonna make it harder for people to find us and to get the help they needed. But we've actually seen somewhere between 80 and 100% more cases coming in than we were seeing before the pandemic started. So a lot of people need our help right now. And I think that really reflects that when you lose your job, um, when you have to stay home to stay safe, uh, that makes it a lot harder to be economically secure and it makes it a hard, lot harder to feel like you're always safe. Um, and so people have really been reaching out for assistance with a lot of different things during this time. So it's been, it's really changed a lot of things. And some of them, I think it's been good in terms of there's more flexibility for people to access um, court than there used to be, because now it's just easy to call into court and you used to have to get permission to call into court. But I also think that you, you miss out on something um, when you are just on the phone and you can't see someone's face and you can't see their expressions and you don't know what the other people who are in the room, whether it's a virtual room or a real room, are doing. And so I think that can be a disadvantage for a lot of people. So big changes in the court system. One thing that's good though, I would say is you can now watch the Supreme Court is streaming when the Supreme Court does oral arguments. You can now watch those online, which you could never do before. And legislative hearings are now all online on, on YouTube. So you can watch those too and see what's going on with the people who are making the decisions about what our laws should be. Excellent. Oh, we've got another question in here. From okay. Is your job stable? Does it rely on Vermont governmental or voter changes? That is a, another really good question. Thank you for asking that, Lauren. Um, my job at this point is pretty stable. Um, I think I said at the beginning, we are funded by a lot of grants from the state and federal government. So that can mean that if there are politicians who don't like what we do, that they could try and cut our funding. Um, but I can say that in my time at Legal Aid, we have not, we've been able to at least keep the funding that we've had and we've been able, been able to expand some of our funding. Um, and for my project in particular, which is to represent people with disabilities, that's not usually um, something that it gets targeted by politicians. Like most people generally agree that people with disabilities should have access to lawyers for protection and for advocacy. Um, and so usually that's not so much of a concern for us. But I think the reality is in these times where there's just so much more need for so many things, hard decisions are gonna have to get made at our state level and at the federal level about what our priorities really are and, and how we want money to be spent. And so could that lead to some changes in how much money legal aid gets to, to be advocates for people who can't afford lawyers? It could, um, but so far in my eight years at legal aid, fortunately, um, we've been able to keep our funding and, and not have to, I haven't had to worry too much about, is this the year that we're not gonna have enough money? So. Excellent. Well, I'd like to thank you, Rachel, so much Absolutely. for your time today. It was really great to be able to access an attorney and ask this kind of questions of you. Yeah. Um, and I just want to let folks know that are on the call, if they're interested in coming next week, we have a veterinarian who's also an animal acupuncture practitioner. Her name is Erica Bruner, and she'll be with us next week at 3.30. So thank you all for your time, and thanks so much for your questions. Thanks for having me. It was great to see you folks. Oh, great. I'm so glad you all came. Thank you.